Well, we're at an exciting time in that, have you noticed that a lot of people are getting their genome sequenced? So there's a lot of genome, genomic data available out there that did not used to be there. Um, 23andMe alone now has 2 million genotype customer, customers, and when you turn in your spit to 23andMe, they offer you to participate in research, and 85 percent of people who turn in their genome for sequencing do accept that offer. So there's information out there that can be mined. Also, there's Open SNP genomic database is publicly available. 23andMe is not publicly available, but you can apply to do research with them. And Ancestry.com and others are sources of genomic information. So given that there's this opportunity, how can we capitalize on it? Well, it might be nice to have a general method that could be applied to traits or diseases that have a significant genomic genetic component. So if we could take genome alone and predict a phenotype like a disease or a trait using only that information and no domain information, um, this is something that could be used, then reused again in a variety of settings. Um, so prediction of the trait is one goal, but another goal is on interpretability of results because we want to um, learn something about the domain area, maybe detect some novel SNPs that are not known, or discover rules of interactions for genes, how they interact in a polygenic disease or a polygenic trait. Um, another goal of this project was to use publicly available tools and data sources. So just a quick little genome, genomic 101. So genomic information is contained in all the cells of the body. And um, here are nucleotide names, but we just code them as A, C, T, and G. A person's genome contains about 3 billion of these base pairs. And we are different from person to person. Um, you share a lot with your close relatives. You have um, about half, half of your genes come from your father and half of your genes come from your mother. Um, and brothers and sisters, full-blooded brothers and sisters will share on the average half of their genes. But for unrelated people, the average difference between DNA is about 0.1 percent of the genome. And these are cataloged in what we call variants of the genome. Single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs, are one of the major cataloging of differences from person to person. Um, there are also insertions, deletions, duplications, and inversions. But we're going to be focusing on SNPs. Um, here's um, a little graphic of your chromosomes. So you have 46 chromosomes, 22 are paired, and so here they look very similar. And then there's the two sex chromosomes that may or may not be the same. Um, females have the two Xs, males have XY, and which look different. Chromosomes are inherited. One of each pair is inherited from the father and one from the mother. And so typically, a person has two copies of each gene, one on each of the paired chromosomes. And they have a combined, they work together to produce a trait or functionality to regulate that. Um, variants are, may occur within a protein coding region of a gene, but also you can have a variant in a regulatory region. We'll see that in the test case we're using here. Or it could be in an RNA gene or an unknown region. Some variants have no impact on function, which is why people can have um, different genotypes but the same phenotype, because there may be no impact on function. There may be a mutation that is silent, or there could be loss of function in one copy of the gene that is compensated for in another copy of the gene. We'll see that that comes into play also. Some phenotypes, which is another name for traits, are Mendelian. They're controlled by whether the inherited gene alleles are dominant or recessive. But some traits are polygenic, controlled by more than one gene, and they're in complex patterns, and we are interested in both, as both occur. Um, known variants are um, typically reported by 23andMe and other sequencing uh, companies, and um, they produce something like this to give to their customers. 
Um, this, is a, this is less information than a VCF format, but it's got everything you need. Um, the SNPs that are cataloged have SNP numbers. Here's an example of a SNP number. Uh, they give the chromosome location, position, and then here is the genotype. So these, are, typically we have two alleles, one from the mother, one from the father, for each of our SNPs, for each of our, every gene that we're following. Sequencing is not perfect. They're, the sequences are called with a 1%, approximately 1% error rate. Um, so the tools that we used are all publicly available. Um, the human genomic data we got from OpenSNP. Mostly it comes from 23andMe and Ancestry.com. Anyone can go there and download um, their full data set is, I think, 1.5 terabytes. I'm going to have to check that. Um, we used only 56 gigabytes because we used only the eye color to, as our first test of this method, the eye color phenotype. And when we pick up this information, there is information for each person on mil of millions of SNPs that are in their genome. Um, so we have to know what to do with this, and we go to dbSNP, where SNP for information on, oh, I think it's like 15 million genes, 15 million SNPs, something like that, are contained, and they're in VCF files, which is, here's the format below here, gives you all the information you would need to go ahead and predict genome. Um, one thing you need to know is how many mutations there are. You don't get this just from 23andMe or OpenSNP. You need to know what the reference allele is, like the ancestral allele, and then what your allele is to see whether there's a change or a mutation. Um, so that's why we need both sources of information. So we picked up 20, 206 megabytes for human information on SNPs. Um, the other tools we used are Python. Uh, NumPy, Pandas, and Scikit-Learn make this job very easy. Um, also, we used R, and you can use R from Python if you use RPy2. Um, so the approach here is, first, build a comprehensive SNP database containing all the SNP information from dbSNP that's joined with the gene information. Read each person file, extract those SNPs that we're tracking because they occur in our database, um, reduce the millions of SNPs to a set of 100 or so candidates, and these are the ones that will pass on to supervised learning. Um, then we employ ma uh, machine learning tools that are available in Scikit-Learn to classify people by phenotype and to rank SNPs and to develop rules for the interactions of SNPs. Um, so what I mentioned is we need to know how many mutated alleles there are, and that's so that we can encode SNPs as the number of mutated alleles. So you saw what you get in the VCF file is two letters, like an AC, an AA, something like that. Um, we coded as zero, one, or two mutated alleles. Um, two mutated alleles is necessary for a recessive monogenic trait. You have to have no working copies of that gene in order to have a recessive monogenic trait. Um, we employed PANDAS for ease of merging information. Here you've got millions of SNPs per person, and uh, PANDAS makes it really easy to merge the information as we can build our data set. Um, we calculate aggregate statistics on each SNP on, that, on the class level. So here, when you have two phenotypes, um, each are in one class, and we aggregate the information, and we select the candidate features, those SNPs, that have within-group commonality, but between-group differences. Um, so the machine learning phase, after we've got the candidate SNPs, so we've gone from millions of SNPs on all the genes that we know of, I, there's about 40,000, um, and we've gone down to 100 or so candidates, and we give this to our machine learning. So first, we are splitting into testing and training sets for supervised learning. We evaluate feature importance using random forest so that we can rank SNPs by their importance. And here we examine the results because this is something we want to know. We want to maybe detect novel SNPs or see if we can detect those SNPs that are known to exist. 
Uh, next step is train a random forest to classify people by their phenotype based only on the SNP information, no domain information. Employ cross-validation grid search to tune parameters for a decision tree to classify, and then examine the tree for novel relationships and extract rules. Um, next, there was a logistic regression modeling step. Um, importing into R all the people's data on the 15 most important SNPs as determined by the random forest. Um, and then to improve the regression fit, remove SNPs whose correlation is higher than 0.7, because otherwise you'll have lousy regression results. Uh, these tend to be, when they're highly correlated, they tend to be in link linkage disequilibrium and inherited together. And they, it's hard for the regression formula to assign blame, so to speak, to highly correlated variables. Um, next, we use that regression model to detect interactions of SNPs um, as they impact the genotype. Okay, so we used eye color for validation of a method. Um, this is an ideal set to validate because eye color has recessive monogenic aspects as well as polygenic aspects, which is going to be on the next slide. So um, you probably know that blue-eyed people, it, blue eyes is a recessive trait. And there are actually two genes that operate in this way, um, OCA2 and HERC2. OCA2 creates the proteins that you need to produce the pigment in the eye. And HERC2 has a, a region in it that regulates the OCA2. So if you have a, um, a recessive double mutation in the HERC2, the OCA2 genes will never get created, even if they're fine. Um, Eye color, um, limitations of our eye color set is, first of all, self-reported data. Um, a lot of people, you know, are they, they said, uh, they have to decide whether their eyes are blue, green, or brown, and real studies have an expert determine this color rather than a person detecting it. Um, also, these were text answers. People would write things like green, brown um, as their eye color, and so we went through first classifying, and, and our biology student classified that as brown, and later I looked at the genome. We're st it's still brown in our set, but probably it's more like green, which is why they put the green first. So there's some problems with that. Another is that when we get our information from these publicly available um, data sources, the haplotype information is unknown. So we don't know which is on which chromosome. And it turns out that makes a difference. It's hard to detect compound heterozygous traits, and it's hard to detect polygenic traits. Okay, so now we used it as a validation method, and um, it has polygenic aspects, which I think is very interesting. Um, so here we see if OCA2 is broken on one chromosome and HERC2 is broken on the other, you can have a blue-eyed person, even though nothing's fully mutated. And here we have the possibilities for M being uh, mother's genome and what you inherited from your mother, D from what you inherited from your father. And here we see that um, mom, mom's genome that she gave you has a fine version of both HERC2 and OCA2. And eye color is recessive blue. So this will give you a nice brown eye color. Um, you, don't, you don't need two working copies, even though what you got from dad is broken on both. Um, and here, we have the same situation except in the reverse. But now look at this situation. This is hard to detect because basically what we're saying is when OCA2 has a mutation of one, one mutated allele, and HERC2 has a mutation of one, two of these four combinations give you brown and two of these four combinations give you blue. And let me show you why. Um, so here we have on the dad allele, um, we have... Uh, HERC2 is broken. Question. Yes. I can't see your Oh, you can't. Oh, I'm, this doesn't show? No. Okay. I should say, then we're talking about, let's look at the bottom row. Okay. Thank you for mentioning that. So on the bottom row, we see that we have a dad allele that has, works fine for, um, for OCA2, but is broken for HERC2. So that means even though the OCA gene is fine, the HERC2 regulates it so it never gets made. And for the mom allele, um, you got 
a working HERC2, but a broken OCA2. So even though it gives a signal to create, um, it's a broken gene. So this person in the bottom row, and it's a flip side in the second bottom row, row those will be people who have, don't have a recessive two allele mutation, they still have blue eyes. And this is difficult to detect <clears throat> because we don't have the phasing information. We don't know what's on what chromosome. Okay, so now to go into what we did with eye color, um, we use random forest as described before. And the brown and the blue eye color were predicted with 89% accuracy. This is using no domain knowledge, just millions of SNPs, and it picks out the right ones. Something that was particularly interesting is that of the millions of SNPs and the tens of thousands of genes, the method selected, if you looked at the top 30 SNPs and their genes, all the, the top SNPs had genes that are known to be associated with eye color and it covered pretty much all of them. Um, and also the top SNPs in the top 10 appear in the literature. So here is a copy of the table. And if you look down, I won't bother to use my pointer, but if you look down, you'll see that um, these top SNPs have appeared in the Rotterdam study or in a patent that was really great because it, it was easy to look up what our results were. Um, sometimes there is a SNP that is in linkage, linkage disequilibrium with one that's really important to prediction, and so the patent provided that information. But basically, there were only two question marks in the top ten, you could see them, and they were near something that is an important SNP. So this was, out of millions of SNPs, the top ten, almost every one of them is known to be important in eye color prediction, and the two that aren't known to be are near, they're on the right genes, and they're near something that is known to be. Um, we see at the bottom the random forest confusion matrix. So the random forest, um, I didn't tune it. Uh, I might go back and do that. I gave it 3,000 trees, like more, more trees, and it, it did pretty well. Um, so it came up with an accuracy of 88%. Yeah. Oh, five minutes, okay. Okay, so the decision tree to avoid overfitting, parameters were tuned using cross-validation grid search on the training set, and here are the parameters that were tuned. Here are the results comparing training set to test set, and we see that there wasn't overfitting here. Um, the accuracy was actually a little bit higher on the test set, um, not very much. Um, decision trees are prone to overfitting, so it was necessary to tune it, and it was good to see that it seemed to um, result in a tree that was not overfit. Now this is the decision tree that was produced, and um, when you look down this tree, I've colored in those that are each node that you can call a blue node, and each node that you can call a brown node, and you notice at the very top of the tree is the most important SNP that's reported in like all the literature as basically dividing human beings. If you have two mutate alleles on this SNP in HERC2, you're usually going to have blue eyes, and you can see that whole Part of the tree, this is a little bit small perhaps, um, but you can, this is anything on this branch of the tree is greater than 1.5, so it's two, two mutated alleles. And we have the blue branch, and then we have those that are where this is either zero or one mutated alleles, and you could get a double recessive in there as described in that complicated way. Hard to know, we'll go back and look. Um, so this is what I've just described. Um, now we want to look for evidence of a polygenic relationship on the tree. Okay, here's a little bit of a blow up on it. So here we see if we, first of all, this is getting decision tree rules, getting rules off the decision tree. And here we have this important SNP. If it's less than 1.5, that means it's zero or one. Then we go down this branch, oops, and, and, um, here is the, then we split again on the same, this is such an important SNP. We split again on this SNP, and here is where the SNP is zero, and you can see it's almost entirely brown-eyed people. Um, there are 97.8% probability with this one rule, because these two rules can be put into one. Okay, now another rule um, is when we go down the one branch, and then we go further for the next split, we see when OCA2 has an allele value of 2, then you have only a 13.6% probability, percent probability of, of being blue-eyed on this tree. 
but this might be some evidence of the, the uh, one and the one compound polygenic trait. Because here we've got HERC2 is one, and now what we need is, um, here we have the OCA is one and the HERC is one, and we see on this node that there, the percentage of blue is higher than it is on this node. Um, and we did see, when we did the analysis, that not everyone who has a 1-1 one, one is going to be um, blue-eyed. Eye, blue some will, some won't. Okay. So I thought that was good, good um, evidence that we might have found some uh, hetero, heterozygous situation. Okay. When we did the logistic regression, looking at the top 15 SNPs, um, first there is the correlation removing, um, out of the 15, seven of them were highly correlated. So they were removed, and you can see the diagram on the right shows them removed. Um, logistic regression, then we're looking for interactions. So um, we fit a model that has, that was looking for both main effects and interactions. And what we found were some main effects, and this is typical, okay, uh, what we found were main effects and we found this one here is, was on that tree, actually. I, I won't go back, um, but a unit increase in this value results in a decrease in the log odds of having brown eyes. And here's the reduction that it, that it produces. Um, and the similar result on the decision tree, which is kind of nice that we have an agreement between our methods. Um, also, logistic regression shows that that one important gene has a good fit. Um, the, here's the pseudo R squared values, 0 0.5, 0 0.51, and 0.68. Okay, future, um, apply this method to human disease that has a significant genetic component to create a risk assessment tool. Um, now this could be something like breast cancer where we don't actually know the complexity of genes. We do know individual genes that highly affect breast cancer, but that's only about 10% of all cases of breast cancer. Worrying about breast cancer susceptibility would be really nice to know what kind of interactions of genes make one more, more susceptible so we can have more surveillance. Also, I'd like to extend the method to employ elastic net logistic regression for feature selection and XG boost for tree pruning. And in conclusion, this is a general method for using supervised learning to predict phenotype from human genomes. Um, we focus on gaining understanding, and the methods that were used were focused on not black box methods. Prediction results were not paramount here. It was re revealing understanding. It was tested with a well-studied prob problem, eye color, achieving good prediction, detected all the genes known to be implicated in eye color, and the SNPs reported to be most influential. Um, we employed publicly available tools and data in an approach that can be used for the different organisms that dbSNP has in its databases. You just go get that information for that organism, and our code will be publicly available. And that's it. Thank you.